webinar. We really appreciate you joining us. We've got a great great crowd here today, especially for August. For an August afternoon, and we really appreciate you being here. I'm Kevin Gulley, the Vice President of Products with Truelytics. And today we're going to be talking about emergency continuity plans. And what you need to know to make sure the business that you've been working to grow will have the greatest opportunity to succeed in the case of an unforeseen emergency. I'm pleased to be joined today by experts in the field. First, Carla McKay. Carla is the Director of Succession Planning and Practice Management at Independent Advisor Group LLC. Carla's primary responsibilities are to lead the corporate focus on providing comprehensive succession planning as well as to recruit advisors to the IAG LPL platform. Prior to joining IAG, Carla was a Managing Director with Gladstone Associates LLC an M&A and corporate advisory firm serving the financial services industry. Carla is going to be walking us through best practices around emergency continuity plans. Second, we're going to be joined today by Terry Mullen, the founder and CEO of Truelytics, who will be reviewing how financial advisors can strengthen their businesses by thinking like a CEO and the importance that a well-defined continuity and transition plan in businesses uh, can lead to business stability. Terry's background prior to Truelytics includes a successful 30-year career in financial services distribution as a senior executive with AIG, Lincoln Financial, and Sun Life. And he's also going to be providing us with an overview and a demonstration of Truelytics software as a service platform for helping advisors value benchmark and improve their businesses. Before we get started, a couple of really quick uh, administrative items to review. First, we're going to leave some time at the end of this discussion for Q&A. So if you uh, have any questions, please feel free to go into the GoToWebinar app into the question section and add any questions to, uh, that you might, might want to uh, have answered. Uh, and second, keep, keep your eyes peeled for an invitation to our upcoming webinar uh, in September. It's going to be uh, a very exciting, and uh, you should uh, make sure you register for that one as well. And finally, uh, today's session is being recorded, and we will make it available for you to review after the session if you want to share it with another folks inside your organization. Uh, and um, uh, let other people know about the great content we'll be sharing today. But for now, I'd like to hand it over to Carla McKay to kick things off and to walk us through what you need to know about emergency continuity plans. So uh, please take it away, Carla. Thanks, Kevin, and good afternoon, everyone, or good morning if anyone's joining us from the West Coast. Um, the topic that we're talking about today is something that's um, really near and dear to my heart, something that I'm very passionate about um, because I feel that it's such a huge need for it within this space. Um, so let's start with some industry statistics to kind of show you why I just said what I said. Most of you know the average age of our industry, the financial advisor, is about 57 years old. Um, obviously, there, there are many advisors that are much older than that, fewer younger advisors coming into the industry. Very scary statistic from my point of view is that 84 of firms or practices out there have no formal interim continuity plan. This is something that would cover you, God forbid you get hit by the bus, um, something happens, you're disabled, you're unable to come into the office for a extended period of time. It's, you know, the unforeseen event should something happen. 84% of firms are missing something that would allow that business to continue without them. Uh, and like I said, of the firms that have the interim plan in place, only 40% of those address disability coverage. Most people think, oh, I have a plan if, you know, if I die, something happens to me. And they often forget, what if I don't die? What if I'm just disabled for 6 to 12 or 18 or 24 months? Why is that so scary? Some startling statistics and facts for you is that after an unforeseen event, more than one in four businesses will never reopen their doors that's a huge number of businesses that will cease to exist. For those that do reopen, 29% of them will fail within two years. What else happens when an owner dies? Revenues drop 60%. And four years after an owner's death, most businesses will still show no sign of recovery. If I'm a business owner, if I'm a financial advisor, that's not a chance that I'm willing to take. I don't want to leave my family stranded. I don't want to leave my employees, my clients. I don't want to leave any of those people with those kinds of statistics that they're facing. And I often hear this, oh, nothing's going to happen to me. I'm fine. I'm healthy. I, I don't lead a, a risky lifestyle. But if, you, if you're one of those people that says, you know what, that's never going to happen to me, I want you to think again.
again, I've been in this industry for a little over nine years as a consultant. In those nine years, I've worked with five firms, five where the owner suddenly passed away, and eight times where an owner faced a disabling event, anywhere from six to 24 months. Sometimes people are in a coma for almost a year. It does happen. And according to actuarial tables, if you have a business that has two partners that are both age 35, the probability that one of them will die before age 65 is 47%. Bump that age up where the both partners are age 50, that probability only drops a little bit down to 40%. The cobbler's children syndrome. You know, a lot of these advisors, a lot of you are doing this type of planning for your clients, but you're failing to do it for yourself. Why is it a big deal? You know, most owners hold a concentrated stock position in their business. There's no diversity for their personal wealth. Uh, like I said, most of the advisors that I work with want to make sure that their family is taken care of if something happens to them. But by not having a plan in place, you're ultimately hurting your surviving spouse or children, again, not to mention your clients and any staff that's left behind. So why aren't advisors preparing? Well, financial advisors are entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are very type A, very driven people. You have poured your heart and soul into growing your business. You've given it everything. It's like a little baby that you've nurtured and grown and, and watched evolve and, and mature over the years. And that's really scary, you know, taking your kids off to college, you know, sending them out of the home, sending them off to be married. It's the same emotional feelings with your business when you've worked so hard to build it. It's almost an identity for a lot of advisors, which leads to, well, you know, facing a mortality is really scary. I'm not going to die. I don't even want to think about dying. I don't want to plan for that death. It's, it's a very emotional process. The process of actually doing this type of planning is very simple and easy. It's very structured once you're able to deal with those emotional issues that go along with it. So why else aren't advisors preparing? I'm healthy. I go to the gym five days a week. I run. I eat healthy. I go to see the doctor. Well, accidents happen. Look back at the statistics I've seen over the last few years. Five of those, eight of those advisors that um, faced a disabling event Three of them actually got hit by a literal bus. One was on a bicycle, one stepped off the curb, one was in another accident. Accidents happen. That's the other thing I hear in the industry all the time. I'm going to plan, I plan on doing this until I'm about 80 years old. And I do see a lot of advisors that are 80 years old. Again, accidents happen, situations change. By that point in time, I mean, we can talk about this later. 80 years old, your clients are probably five years plus or minus your own age. You kind of question if that's a depreciating asset that, because those clients are in distribution phase, so the, the business is actually losing AUM each year. So I plan to do this till I'm 80 years old. Terry, you and I talked about this uh, the other day about what goes hand in hand with being 80 years old as yep. an advisor. Yep. As, as a matter of fact, so Carl, why is it that is it because they want to be in the business, or is it because they have to be in the business? Well, no surprise, this industry is very lucrative, and uh, it's something that you can do well into your senior or, or golden years if you so, so desire. Um, the other reason, you know, a lot of advisors got into this business because they love working with clients, finding clients, they love managing money. Um, it has become their identity as an entrepreneur, so it's, it's very hard for them to, to ever think about stop doing it or, or doing something else or even slowing down. Interesting. And are there risks with uh, cognitive impairment? I mean, as advisors age, they're, they're dealing with, you know, in, in cases, millions and millions of dollars for their clients. And, you know, there, I know that there's a lot of talk around, you know, dementia and things like that. And, and being able to work with your clients is, is that something that you're hearing about right now? And, and, and can these types of things help those advisors plan for that? It absolutely is. And it comes into play more often when there are multiple owners within a firm. Um, I recently worked with a group that wanted to write specific provisions into their operating agreement on, you know, someone who's facing that type of 
of disease or illness is not necessarily going to A, be able to identify it, and B, be able to accept it. So I see cases where advisors or owners are writing provisions where they can call each other out if there is a question about cognitive impairment, um, which is really interesting and, and something that does need to be addressed, especially as most of our population and our advisor industry is in those baby boomer golden years. And it, it's really interesting. You mentioned earlier about the cobbler's children. You know, for most advisors, if their clients that were business owners didn't have the types of uh, emergency continuity plans, succession plans in place, they would be calling them out and trying to help them with that. But it's just an amazing statistic that, you know, over 80% of the financial advisory firms that we deal with every day do not have formal uh, business continuity plans for, for those eventualities. So in effect that they do have one and that's that their clients are going to, uh, you know, be serviced either for a while by nobody or by, you know, maybe an 800 number. Um, and you know, it's something that, you know, hopefully everybody can start to address and, and, and put things in place because, you know, accidents do happen. Things happen. Absolutely. Um, every day I, I, so surprised and startled by the statistics and some of the quote-unquote excuses I hear for why don't you have a plan? What if something happens to you? Um, it's, it's Like I said, it's a very emotional topic to talk about. So another reason advisors aren't preparing is they think, oh, well, if something happens to me, so-and-so will buy it. Which perhaps, you know, maybe you have a, a gentleman's handshake with an advisor you know who said, oh, yeah, step up and run it. Um, unfortunately, it's going to be at an extreme discount, you know, based upon the statistics earlier. You've, revenue drops 60%. The advisor that's coming in to run your practice isn't really too motivated to continue running that book of business, which, again, means your family is, is left high and dry or not as well off as they would had you done the necessary planning. And your clients, I'm sorry? right? The, the, the client, the clients are are going to be left high and dry for yes. if if that's the case. Absolutely, and I've heard that one too. Well, if something does happen to me, my clients will just go elsewhere. Um, you know, the little thing called DOL that's out there right now. This mentality doesn't quite sit right with me, you know, because that means you're not really being a fiduciary. If if you're like, oh, my clients will go elsewhere. I mean, you're not maybe necessarily putting those clients first, like you just alluded to, Terry. Um, my other question is, do you not want to extract any value from what you have worked so hard to build? Uh, you guys, advisors got to think about this. You're building this business. This is a legacy that you're creating that you can then maybe pass down to someone else or maybe monetize it somehow. Unfortunately, every single business out there will transition at some point whether it's a sale or by death, it's going to happen. It's unavoidable. It's so smart to prepare for that now. Think about what you ultimately would want to have happen to that business when the time comes. And Carla, when, when you are dealing with firms, is, is it true that, you know, setting it up so it can, it can survive without you? Because most of, most of these firms were built because of, you know, a, a person who was a great relationship person, great money manager, had great relationships. And, you know, the, it's not as easy to just plug someone in. But if they do the proper planning, not only is that going to be more advantageous, I would, I, I know it's true from the, from what we'll go over later, but the business is going to be worth more to somebody else. You're building value in the business by doing things like planning for, you know, uh, emergencies that, that would happen um, even even if you haven't done a formal succession plan. Absolutely. Like you said, we'll, we'll see that a little bit later during the demo, but businesses are valued and, and part of that is what is the risk factor that goes with a business? And, and obviously a business that doesn't have the right infrastructure or the right systems and processes, including an interim plan, whether, whether it's long-term or short-term succession plan. That's kind of a ding on the value of the firm. It, it is going to have a negative impact. Um, the more structure and the more processes that are around a business, the more valuable it looks to a potential buyer. Because remember, any 
any buyer is going to buy the business for what it can do going forward, not what it's done in the past. And the business can't move forward, particularly without an owner, without those proper things in place. Yep. So what are some of the options? Um, we, we danced around some of these. Um, there are a lot of options. And here's the thing, you know, you always have to start somewhere. And this is your, your interim or emergency continuity plan. This is should worst case happen. It's not your long-term plan. It's not your plan when you retire. It's for the unforeseen event. And the, the plan that you start with, I have to say, is not necessarily going to be the final plan. Um, some options. First is an operating agreement that's going to have some buy-sell provisions in it. Now, this is typically used for a firm with multiple owners, one or two owners or more, or maybe a firm that has corporate structure in place that has some next gen that's already employed at the firm but isn't necessarily an owner at the time of the event. So you put provisions in your operating agreement that facilitate the sale to an insider who is involved in the business on a day-to-day -day basis. So they're currently an employee with the firm. So maybe you don't have a, another partner or somebody. There's a buy-sell agreement. It's the same thing. It's either or operating agreement or buy-sell agreement, depending on how you're structured. Um, an agreement that an insider can buy the business. Now, for a firm that maybe doesn't have somebody, you can use a practice continuity agreement or a PCA, as we like to call them in the industry. Now that would facilitate a transition to another advisor or another firm that is an outsider. Um, we'll see these a lot um, within maybe like a broker-dealer type of relationship where you know one LPL advisor has a PCA with the guy down the street that if something happens, that individual has the first right to purchase the book. Now they can be one way or they can be dual. You know, it can just be one, one to the other, or they can agree to, to do it for each other's business. There are some disadvantages with this. Obviously, it's to an outsider. It's not somebody that knows your clients intimately, knows how you run your business. In these situations where there is a PCA sign, signed, I highly recommend that the advisors are meeting at least biannually, maybe quarterly, to at least keep each other up to date on what's going on with their practice share some of that information of behind the scenes of running it. Um, also let your clients know that you have an agreement signed with John down the street that if something happens, he could step up and, and serve as the client account. Is that something that you uh, would recommend is if you have uh, something in place that you would communicate that with your clients? And I'm Absolutely. sure that there would be people that would think that that would be a negative, but um, no, absolutely. I mean, clients are asking, um, especially those clients that are getting older themselves. They're starting to ask and question, hey, what's the plan if this happens? Um, it's not a negative because it's being transparent. And I think that's what the, this industry is really built upon is, is having that personal relationship with your clients and being transparent and being forthcoming. And it also kind of plays into, like you said earlier, Terry, this is the type of planning advisors are already doing for their clients. And you can share, hey, you know, just so you know, this, this is what I have in place. It, it, it's a nice segue to the conversation back and forth. Yeah, and it's showing them that you are being, you know, uh, responsible and, and preparing for, you know, unforeseen events, which is what they are helping their, their own clients with. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Now, the practice continuity agreement, too, can also be used during a period of incapacity. So in a situation of disability, um, that person could come in and, and run the practice for a period of time, or like I said, it can, you know, they can conduct an orderly sale that way. Um, so it can be either temporary or permanent, depending upon the situation. Um, it's, it's an effective backup plan or a temporary bridge, you know, like I said, for the short-term disability. And sometimes it allows for support without succession, meaning that the firm agrees to client cross referrals or some other type of support during a staff shortage. So there's there's a lot of uses that can be applicable there with the, the PCA. And of course, this should be a legal document that is drawn up um, based upon obviously the laws for your particular state. But um, 
something that an attorney can definitely assist with. And not a bad document to have. Um, it doesn't mean that what is in that PCA will actually happen because the, the buyer, quote unquote buyer has, they're not obligated to fulfill the agreement, but it's a nice to have um, at least as something in place. And it can change too. You know, if, if you have a falling out with the guy down the street or he leaves the industry, you can update this and change it regularly. And we'll talk about that a little bit later too. Uh, next on the list is a business continuity trust. Um, these are really interesting, and, and I've used these predominantly in family-owned businesses where there are children in the business that are slated to be next-gen, but maybe they're not quite experienced enough today to step up. So practice continuity trust kind of facilitates that the children can kind of take over the business with board oversight until they're definitely ready. Um, and it's a really good tool to use because it does protect the business and it can create an income stream for a surviving spouse if needed. Um, it's definitely a little more complex of a planning need and like I said, mostly used for family business situations. It is really important to consider tax consequences too um, with all of these situations. Um, obviously any type of sale is gonna have tax consequences um, with a family business. You just take that into consideration, make that part of your conversation with your attorney or your consultant if you're drafting an interim continuity plan. And um, Carla, would, would, would all of those uh, uh, require to have a evaluation of your business be done? I say yes, <laughs> because you're, you're going to want to put in all of these agreements how you're going to determine the price for the transition. Um, Baseline valuations should be done on an annual basis anyway, um, back into a formula that's included in this agreement that dictates terms, conditions, and, and how everything is going to be funded and how you're going to determine price. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have on here, too, an advisory board. Um, this is really interesting. Um, I, I'm big on advisory boards. I think they're a great resource for firms. Um, so you can set up an advisory board that upon death of the owner, that would transition automatically to a board of directors. That board of directors then can implement the owner's wishes or prepare the firm for sale should they need to. Um, so that's kind of a, an interim group that can run the company. Um, an advisory board does not get paid when that transitions to a board of directors. They are being compensated for their time spent running that business until the ultimate transition takes place. So again, that's another, that's another great tool for larger firms. And finally, a succession backstop program. Um, I'm a big fan of this. It's your ultimate protection at the, at the very end. Um, if you're affiliated maybe with an OSJ, um, you can execute an agreement that that OSJ would be able to purchase your book or any other type of program. There's, there's other groups out there, other platforms that have similar affiliation models where you can write that in. And, and maybe that's a good starting point. If you have no idea where to begin, you at least want to put something in place where somebody can step up and, and step in and, and run that business and take care of those clients. And your family does get a little bit of a compensation for it through that process. And, and it, so, it sounds, Carl, like that would be pretty easy uh, to, to put in place, even if it's not the perfect scenario. At least it's that basically that stopgap that you uh, talk about, and that would then allow you to uh, potentially look at other more formal type of arrangements uh, that may be more beneficial to you um, and your family. Absolutely. It's, I mean, in essence, it's a buy-sell agreement with your affiliated group. It absolutely is. Like I said, it's, it's better than nothing. It's maybe not the best solution, but it's a starting point until you kind of think things through. Um, these... Um, this type of planning needs time. Um, I, like I said, it's such an emotional issue and topic, and I, I really encourage advisors and owners when they're thinking about putting this into place is to really sit back and think about, what do I want? What do I need from the business? If something happens to me, what do I, what do I want to have happen? What are, what are my options? What would be best case scenario? What would be absolute worst case scenario? 
how can I plan for that? What do I want to leave my family um, with? What, what do, I, do I want to leave a legacy? How do I want that legacy to go forward? So I always say, let's start early. Ideally, the day that you open your business, you should be considering all of these what ifs. That's what being a business owner is. Um, oftentimes, advisors start a business and they're they're so involved in running the business, you know, the vision and the thought behind it, because you don't have clients when you start out in this industry. So you're you're working on the business, and and as that business grows, you're so busy working in the business that sometimes you forget to take a step back and work on the business again. And and this is one of those issues that's so important. So start early. Start writing things down. Um, work through the emotions. Give yourself time. Um, again, this type of planning does take a lot of time, and it takes careful consideration. And more importantly, it requires regular reviews and revisions, because your situation is probably going to change. I suggest that advisors sit down at least once a year and review their emergency continuity plan. Um, a lot can happen. You can meet new people. You can hire new talent. You could have a child that graduates and, and wants to join the business. There's a lot that can happen. Your objectives might change. Third, utilize insurance. You know, we tell our clients to have personal life insurance. We sometimes, you know, most of us have personal life insurance. Um, I always recommend company-owned life insurance that could fund a sale or a transition. There is also another option that everybody forgets about, which is disability insurance. Say you're one of those people that, that faces a disabling event and it does trigger a sale. I usually say, just to throw it out there, is after a disabling event, 12, 12 months after the event is what would trigger a sale or a transition. In that case, you don't have life insurance to use to fund the buyout. There is disability insurance. It's not the cheapest thing out there, depending upon your age, but it is a resource that is often overlooked. And, and, and one of the things that, Carlos, sorry, as you, you mentioned disability insurance, um, the Financial Services Institute, which is a, you know, obviously a very well-known uh, industry group, um, offers two independent advisors that are members of theirs uh, disability insurance um, that is, you know, very affordable. And, it, and it's great because a lot of uh, you know, a lot of advisors are out there are, are independent and they don't, aren't part of a big firm that offers these types of things and it can be very expensive, but there are ways and places in the industry that you can leverage to get, uh, you know, plans that are affordable and, and that make sense and, and, uh, you know, it's, it's critical because it's not just if, it, if you die, it's, you know, what would happen if you have a disabling event and, and how can you, uh, how can you plan for that and, and have, you know, the financial considerations. Definitely, definitely. And just for anybody that's out there that's wondering how that insurance works, um, life insurance, the funds from that are typically used as the down payment. Um, if there's any balance that needs to be made up, we typically recommend it's paid out over five years. So it's, it's not a huge term, you know, if you're worried about your, your surviving spouse or, or children. And then the last one is to create a day after plan. This is something that I love. Um, Think of it kind of as your survival manual, that if something happened to the owner, it is a resource or a tool or a book, what have you, that you leave behind and it would allow someone to come in and run the business. It has passwords, um, website accounts, who to contact, here's the client list. It's everything that anybody would need to know to come in to run that business. It contains all pertinent information. Sometimes it includes scripts to communicate the event or the transition to clients and vendors and whatnot. Um, it's a survival manual for your business should the owner not, not be able to show up one day. That's great and, and I will talk about that a little bit. That is one of the things that we have heard from advisors across the country is you know, okay, I, I, the, for the ones that do have a continuity plan, they have that written agreement. They know what is going to, you know, how it's going to be funded, what the price is, who the people are. But it's really that, okay, now when that happens, who's the landlord? Who, you know, who, who have, what are all the technologies that I have and the passwords? It's, it's the, it's all the pebbles in the shoe, as, as my partner likes to say, that can get in the way and having a place that uh, you have and 
we are actually in the middle of developing and will be launching in the next uh, month or so that day after plan so you can store everything in one place and be able to know that if that happens here's exactly the game plan of what has to what you have to do absolutely yeah it allows the business to continue without the owner there I, I, who's going to who's going to find paychecks for the staff it's, it's the little things that people forget about or how to update your website and what messaging to put there it's it's a remarkable tool but as you can how see, long, I mean, go ahead, Terry. Carla, how long um, of a process is this? Is this a, you know, is it days, weeks, months, years? I mean, because it, 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 it's, it's, it seems like a lot, and that is probably a reason why 84% don't have it, but it's critical. Um, but talk about the process. It's, you know, it's not as complex as people think that it is. Remember, this is just your emergency plan. It's not your long-term plan. This isn't how things necessarily have to be. Um, something can be thrown together pretty quickly if you have, if you have a clear idea of where you're headed. Um, don't do it alone, another, another piece of advice. Um, talk to your peers. Talk to your attorney or your accountants, or there are consulting firms out there that provide this type of service. Really think through your options, and once you, once those get clear, it's it's very simple and pretty cost effective to actually implement. That's great, and, and and remember, if, without a plan, your your clients are going to be serviced by somebody else, and and most likely, if you're with a broker dealer, with you know a broker dealer 800 number. I mean, I can't tell you how many orphan accounts there are, and those are all you know folks that uh, are now being serviced by somebody that. Uh, that doesn't know your clients and, and for advisors that weren't prepared. Mm -hmm. There really is no excuse to not have an emergency continuity plan. Um, it's, it's like buying, you know, you don't drive a car without insurance on that vehicle. It's kind of the same thing. You know, why, why are you running a business without that type of quote unquote insurance on the business? Um, to prepare for the what ifs, because they happen. Well, Carla, this has been great. Uh, this is Kevin jumping in here. I hope everybody can hear me better. I, I apparently was not uh, very uh, understandable at the, during the kickoff, so I apologize for that. I hope you can hear me better now. Um, but I thought it would be a good time to transition maybe over to uh, hand things over to Terry for uh, a few minutes to walk us through some of the things that Truelytics can do to help businesses uh, uh, understand their, uh, their organizations better, value their companies more effectively, and we can now also jump into some of the things that about uh, about uh, emergency transition uh, and a continuity planning, which we're actually starting to put into the program. Uh, and Terry, I'm hoping Terry can talk to that a little bit as well. Great, thanks, Kevin, and, and good afternoon or good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us, Carla. Thank you very much um, for your insights. Uh, this is something that is critically important for advisors to make sure that they plan, uh, because not only does it impact their business. Uh, but also would impact their clients and, and um, from I, I talked to hundreds and hundreds of advisors who you know it really is they're trying to do the best thing for their clients and if you want to do the best thing for your clients being prepared and planning for unforeseen events with a business continuity plan is, is critical um, with Truelytics uh, Truelytics is a software as a service platform that helps advisors strengthen benchmark and value their business we believe that there is a great opportunity for advisors who have spent uh, years building their business uh, really to now understand the drivers of the business, not just in terms of you know, how, how many assets I bring in and how many clients I have, but what are the, what are the drivers that can help you improve uh, your business, um, not just from a bottom line standpoint, but from a, from a valuation standpoint and, and uh, allow you to uh, to, to, to get paid at some point, whether that's in through an emergency continuity or through succession plan or through the sale of your business to somebody, uh, we, we believe that we can really help you uh, in understanding that. So as you go into the, the Truelytics tool, I'll just spend a couple minutes going through a demo and what it, what it allows you to do, but you will, will give, get, in, get information on your firm, your ownership, advisors, your clients, your processes, revenues, and financials, and that will then generate your Truelytics evaluation, which is on a discounted cash flow valuation basis. 
which we believe is the best way to value wealth uh, advisory firms. Um, but we'll also show it to you under uh, other methodologies as well. It will give you a score, like a GPA on a 4.0 scale, and show you what your business, client, and market stability scores are. <clears throat> and more importantly, show you what the potential impact that that score has on your valuation. One of those uh, key uh, indicators, key performance indicators, is not having or having a, an emergency continuity plan. And that is one of the places where for those firms that don't have it, more than 80%, they are losing value uh, in their business. So very quickly, we will ask questions on when you were established, how you're structured, um, how you're registered with the SEC, how many owners and, and advisors there are, professional staff, other staff. We get information on your custodian and your broker dealer. We get information on your ownership, if there's more than one and the percentage and the, and the uh, age of the owners. Same thing with their advisors, if there are more than one. Uh, we'll get information on their, them. All of the questions that we ask through the software go into a discounted cash flow valuation. That, 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 um, uh, so there's a reason that we ask all the questions that we do. Then we ask about your clients. How many do you have? What's your assets under management? Your average client age. Uh, how many years they've been with you? How many do you add and lose each year? How do you get your new clients uh, through referrals? What percentage? Um, what percentage of your AUM is with your top five relationships? And do you do institutional business? Uh, do you have a relationship with the next generation? Then we capture information on your processes. Um, do you have emergency continuity plans and written succession plans, non-competes? All of these things, again, are going to go into um, what that business valuation is because of the risk associated with that future cash flow uh, if you don't have some of these things. Then we capture information on the use of technology. Um, not only is it great data to have, but it's also going to tell you how ready uh, you are to be uh, to, to, to sell or to buy another business um, and if there's going to be significant costs involved in that because of uh, 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 you know the technology that you're using isn't compatible with the, the firm that you're looking at to either buy or sell. We get information on your revenues, net revenue, growth rate, uh, what is recurring or reliable each year, uh, if you have discretion and what your basis points that you're charging on your advisory business. For those of you that are shifting as the industry is from uh, commission sales to advisory business, we get it broken down by product area. And then the last page is on your financials. Um, we get five years of net revenue if you have it and then the breakdown by uh, category on your expenses. We do the add backs and adjustments uh, and other uh, non-operating income and expenses. And after roughly 30 minutes of inputs, you hit save and finish and it gives you, uh, as I mentioned, your Truelytics score, which is a GPA in this case, uh, in this example, it's a, a better than C, little bit better than a C student. Uh, with a 233, it shows a discounted cash flow evaluation of two million one hundred and eighty eight thousand dollars and a business stability score of a C, a B minus in client stability and a B mark minus in market stability. It shows you your valuation ratios and your P and L. Uh, and it also is very transparent on the discount factors that we uh, assign to that um, based on the business client and market stability. We then show you a scorecard that shows you the 40 different key performance indicators, the the, the letter grade that you got and the potential impact that that has on your valuation. So you can now look at areas that you would want to improve uh, to increase the valuation. A couple of areas that I'll just highlight very quickly. Number one is we have all in this industry been told to, that, that referrals are the best way to get uh, clients. I'm not going to argue with that. However, by only refer, uh, using referral sources, that is actually a negative when it comes to the valuation of your business to a potential buyer. Uh, and the reason for that is that puts that cash flow at risk because the relationship is what is going to have to be transferred over versus a firm that had a client acquisition strategy that included maybe seminars or, or direct marketing or, or other things that would not necessarily be only with the relationship that you have. The second area that a lot of people don't uh, uh, typically uh, focus on is the relationship with the next generation and having a having a relationship with the children of your clients. Fidelity does a study every year and tells us that over 80% of those assets will leave 
when the parents die if you do not have a relationship with the children. So it is really critical for the value of your business to start to have uh, a relationship with the kids, even if it's not going to be a very fruitful relationship while they're growing, um, you know, while they're in their, uh, until they get to their higher earning years. Um, the next section that we show you is the pro forma, which does a uh, projected uh, revenue and expenses, and it also shows the present value on how we got to the discounted cash flow valuation. And then the last area that I will share with you is other methodologies. So there are other methodologies that people use when they look at valuing businesses, whether that's on a multiple of recurring revenue, uh, multiple of EBITDA, or multiple of EBOC. At the end of the day, this will give you basically your Kelly Blue Book that shows you what your business would potentially be worth to a buyer uh, if you were going to sell. Clearly, a value is only a point in time, and it's what someone is willing to pay for the business and the structure that you would get. But the, the, the software tool allows you to look at areas of your business that have an impact on your valuation for a potential sale, whether that's two, five, ten years out. It will allow you to focus on the areas that will give you the maximum uh, impact to your valuation. Um, so that is the current software as it stands. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we are adding to that, and Kevin, you may be able to share some of the screens, the day after plan for emergency business continuity, where you can have one place that will give you all of the things that you need when you, uh, you know, if, if, if that eventuality happens. Uh, so everybody's on the same page and you know exactly um, uh, what needs to happen and, and where those uh, agreements are or what the technology is uh, or what have you. Um, so with that, I will, I will stop my formal comments. Um, uh, clearly, if there are any questions, we're happy to use it. But one final comment, and, and I've, I, I have uh, said this a lot, so some, if you've been on more than one conference call, I, I apologize. But, you know, it is clear to me that many people in this industry really don't think of their business as a business. They talk about it as a practice. They talk about it as a book. Uh, practices for sports and yoga and books are to read. This is a business, and it's something that you have built over the course of many years, and to really start to look at it as a business, to do the things that are necessary to plan, uh, that you deal with your clients every day, things like emergency continuity plans and succession plans and to, to face them uh, and to understand the drivers of your business is really what the goal of Truelytics uh, is, is to help you, the financial advisor, understand your business so you can have better information, so you can make better informed decisions uh, to make more money and to have a business that's worth more money in the future. Terry, I could not agree more. Very well said. Kevin, I'll uh, All right. turn it back to you. I, I don't know if I can stop sharing my screen. Sure, I can do that. Um, so. I would also I, we've we've received a few uh, a few questions. So um, here's one: What is the typical price difference between an emergency takeover, i.e., a sudden death, versus a transition acquisition over a year? Does that make sense? Um, in which and what regard? I'm, I'm maybe not clear. I, I think it's it, if if uh, how much differential is it in an emergency? Uh, buyer versus if you were have to have planned that and sold it. Well, if you're if you're I doing that, it correctly. I think that's the question. Yeah, if you're doing it correctly for your interim plan, there you shouldn't see a, a, a cost difference in what you would net. I'm assuming is what the question is. Um, if you don't have an interim plan in place, that's where you're faced with the revenue drop 60%. You may be in a fire sales situation. Um, so the difference isn't necessarily in the the timing, but rather the planning that's behind it. Yeah, and that, I, does that make I sense? think you mentioned it, but one of one of our clients, um, broker dealer, uh, they had this happen. One of their advisors died, and 50% of the assets uh, there was a 50% dilution in value in the in the first 90 days. Mm -hmm. So not having a plan in place is having a plan in place, and that's one that is going to not give you uh, anywhere close to what the value of the business that you built over over the course of uh, you know in some cases decades. 
Right. But if you're communicating your plan to your clients and you have that day after plan in place, it's almost like the owner's still there in a way. That business, with proper planning, the business can continue without the owner, without missing a beat. That's where the difference comes into play with a value for should something happen. Absolutely. So, and, I, and I want to talk to that a little bit more. But first, there's one more question from John. And actually, Carrie, I think you can probably speak to this. Uh, the question is, is this valuation comparable to a biz equity valuation? So they, I'm thinking the answer is the, biz is, equity, the company biz equity, right? I'm thinking. Yeah, no, biz, yeah, biz, biz equity is actually a partner of ours. They they have uh, a software tool that can value small businesses using publicly available data. So they're going to uh, capture data that is publicly available that they wouldn't have on some of the things. And I don't believe that it's on a discounted cash flow valuation basis. And if you were to talk to their folks, what they would tell you is the the TrueLytics valuation tool and methodology will be significantly more accurate than, than the valuation that they would get based on publicly available data through uh, some of the data sources. Um, but what, what we know with the TrueLytics tool is that we are doing it on a discounted cash flow valuation basis, which looks at the specifics of your business based on your clients, so your, on your business stability, client stability, and market stability, uh, including your line item expenses to get a uh, very accurate uh, discounted cash flow valuation basis uh, as well as if you looked at it on a multiple of revenue EBITDA and EBOC. And there are a lot of misconceptions, and Carly, you could probably speak to this, people thinking that, oh, my business is worth X times uh, the trailing 12 months revenue. But the fact of the matter is that businesses, even if they have the same number of assets, the same number of clients, and the same number of revenues, would be valued very, very differently based on the underlying attributes of that business. Clearly, I don't think you would pay as much for a business that had an average client age of 75 as you might for one that had an average client age of 50, or one that had recurring revenue of 90% versus one that had recurring revenue of 40%. Those, those underlying attributes are very, very different, and that is what we capture uh, in the TrueLytics software uh, that I that is not captured uh, if you do it through a company like Biz Equity. Biz Equity is a is a terrific company, particularly for for the millions of small business owners that you may be targeting. Um, I don't believe it would be anywhere close to being as accurate on financial and wealth management firms uh, as as TrueLytics. Terry, did you did you explain what the the discounted cash flow model actually is? Maybe it'd be helpful as to how that ties into yeah. the key performance indicators. Sure. I mean, if you think about what a discounted cash flow valuation basis, and Carly, you mentioned this earlier, um, people aren't buying what you did in the past. They're buying the future uh, cash flow that's going to be generated for that business. And what the what the software does is it takes that future cash flow uh, out into the future and then discounts back based on interest rates and risk premiums. So what are the risks associated with that cash flow? Some of those things are things like the average client age, the number of clients you have versus per, you know, to the advisors, um, things that, you know, like uh, not having a relationship with the next generation. Um, so it takes those and, and discounts them back. And each one of those areas has a maximum of 5% uh, risk premium associated with it. Um, so that's how the, the, that we generate the TrueLytics discounted cash flow valuation. And, Happy for you to uh, to add any um, any additional color. No, I agree. That is the the model, the methodology that should be used for valuing those businesses. Absolutely, it's um, not a point and in time. If, it's not historical. It's going forward. If you're interested in more details on that, we actually had a webinar specifically about discounted cash flow valuations and how they work and why it's so so important in this particular industry. And you can go to TrueLix.com and look up the, uh, the the videos there and you'll be able to find that that recorded webinar um, to get some more details on that. We also have some great blog posts on it as well. So uh, feel free to dig in on, on TrueLix.com. Uh, just before we jump, uh, I wanted to give you a really quick overview. These are just screenshots, but the product is in development. We're hoping that it's going to be uh, out in the marketplace in September where people can start putting in information about their emergency continuity plan and that day after plan in particular, that transition plan in case something happens. This is basically the solution that we want to become the industry standard 
for businesses in this space to say, if I am putting an emergency continuity plan in place and something happens to me, right, this is going to be the hour or two that you spend to make sure that if something does happen, your business is going to go forward. It's going to seamlessly transition. We put information about all the different types of important contacts inside your organization, the emergency contacts, the personal contacts like your spouse and, and, and siblings and family members, professional contacts like your accountants and your lawyers and your uh you know, your landlord, as Terry was mentioned before, uh, your different staff members, your key staff members, your key vendors, all that information is going to go in and you can uh, let the system know whether or not if this emergency continuity plan gets activated by the emer your emergency contact because something actually happened, which of these people should be notified right away. And so we're going to have a whole email program that's set up into this that's going to notify people if something happens. Um, Keep them informed that something is, is, is uh, that this has been unlocked. We're going to make sure all this information is highly encrypted and highly secure. Uh, we're going to turn it into a, we're going to put it into a blockchain in phase two, so that it'll be even more secure uh, and uh, and hidden for um, for security purposes going forward. We put information about uh, about the different agreements that you may have. Um, so that could be your broker dealer agreement, or it could be non compete agreements, and you add these to the system as well, so that the person who's going to be taking over is going to have everything in one place. They're going to be able to see what's happening, what they need to be aware of, what they need to be concerned about as far as uh, employment agreements or uh, ownership agreements or stock sharing agreements, things along those lines. Um, we'll have information in there about um, different to-dos that you may want to uh, have someone suggest. For example, you know, these are my top 10 clients. Here's their phone numbers. Here's a spreadsheet with their information. Please call them immediately, right? Call them today. Uh, you know, so things along those lines, different uh, actions that you want people to take, and, of course, information about um, about uh, technology so that um, you can put in information about your CM, CRM and uh, your username and password and login and who the key contact is that someone should talk to about the CRM and so that if they need to get access to the technology or what your, you know, what your accounting system is and, you know, how they can get access to that so they can make sure they can jump in and, and start handling everything and, as Carla said, start writing the paychecks. Uh, to make sure things keep going forward. All that information is going to go in here. We're going to store it extremely securely. And instead of having to, uh, you know, have this on different sheets of paper or maybe uh, different places in the organization, it's all going to be one spot. And if you have an issue, you can come back here once a year, just make some changes to it, may slightly modify it. We'll, we'll store it. We'll secure it. We'll make sure that if something happens, it's going to be unlocked. And when, it ha when the unlocking happens, that, trans that transition you know, God forbid that it needs to take place, is going to be as seamless as possible. So we're very excited about this. Um, as soon as we get it up, we would love for you folks to come back and take a look at it and give us feedback uh, and tell us how we can improve it. Um, but expect to see an announcement in the next month about this, about this being available. So thank you for your time today, everybody. Uh, and thank you, Carla and Terry, for your great insights. And uh, uh, please keep your eyes open for the upcoming webinars. And we'll have this available for you tomorrow, uh, especially with my very quiet audio at the very beginning uh, <laughs> as a video for you to be able to come in and uh, look at the screens and, and get any insights that you may have missed from, from the questions earlier. So thanks again for joining us today. Enjoy the rest of your summer, and we will talk to you in September. Thanks so much.